In this Kings of War Battle Report, I'm gonna play a Hellpiece Rift campaign game. Hello there! I like to watch battle reports to get better at games. So I started making short, summarized battle reports that focus on learning points. So welcome to my channel, Newbie Dice. Do like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon if you enjoy my videos. And welcome back! So it's been a while guys. Well, basically I have not had as much time to record videos because I just have a new addition to my family so I just leveled up and multi class into a father and I have much less time to make videos but nonetheless I'll try to keep this going and of course I'm working on more some projects that's more interesting to me firstly is my local Hellpiece Rift campaign after that will be my Call to Arms games I did not take part in Into the Rift so because I'm running and playing in this local campaign so let's talk about this local campaign. It is set up by my partner in crime, Guard, in all the way in Singapore. Our lockdown restrictions are a little bit more lax and we are able to play face-to-face -face games. We have 13 players in this campaign and we're split into two teams following the Hellpiece Rift rules. We are playing two, two weeks in each plane, so material plane, and then the final battle will be on the astral plane, so it will all conclude in January with an epic final battle, Team Gorat versus uh, Team Ilios. That's the two alliances that's uh, named in this campaign. We also have a general and bodyguard unit that can level up, gain experience and level up. So creating your general is like the international campaign day. So you choose a normal hero, not a living legend. You can take any upgrades that the hero can usually take. You craft special effects by adding two artifacts to the hero. And these artifacts do not count as being taken. You can still use it in the rest of your army. Basically, you're just crafting two special effects to be added to the hero. It's worth 200 points or less. You can change loadout in between games because in Hellpiece Rift, there are unique spells and items to each plane. So we want to not limit the loadout of the general and the bodyguard. The bodyguard itself is a 300 point maximum unit. And the items taken by the bodyguard counts as the item because they can only take one item as per normal. Well, you can level up your bodyguard by getting experience points. A uh, kill by the general or bodyguard is defined as having dealt damage to a unit that is routed in the same turn. So shenanigans like shoot and surge into combat, drain life into combat, stuff like this works. Combined melee charges and combined shooting effects also works as long as the general or bodyguard dealt at least one damage and then it gets routed. There's also bonus XP for getting them painted. Upon uh, reviewing, I think if we were to run this in future, the general kills should be worth, worth one XP because two is a little bit too much, uh, especially when you can get earn it through like combined shooting and then your general still kind of stays safe. So this is the level up table that were got extracted from Clash of Kings 2017, if I'm not wrong, there is this table. And of course it's uh, from all the way in 2nd edition. So the only thing we changed was Dreadful. It used to be that it denies uh, Inspiring Reroll. So now it just gives Dread. So we thought that it's more appropriate since 3rd edition has the rule called Dread. So on to our list. For myself, I'm playing Redkin. I've been playing a lot of Redkin lately because I do have an actual Redkin army. It was my first Kings of War army actually. So the only thing I dislike about the army physically, the appearance is that it looks a little bit patched together because there's no consistent team in the basing and stuff. But nonetheless, I've come back to Redkin and my bodyguards are a horde of shock troops with basically I take everything <laughs> within 300 points. I took the plague pods, I took phalanx. I don't usually take phalanx but because I want them to survive. And then I took a Brew of Strength. My general is a brute mother called Kerrigar, Queen of the Swarm. If you find the name familiar, it's uh, it's basically lifted off the story of a video game. So you might recognize the story and the character's name. Yeah, I got another brute mother. And another thing is I took the pointy wizard's head so that I can have level 3 spellcasting in total to roll 3 dice during the channeling phase. I took the ranged options that's usually available to the brute mother, but uh, after playing my first game, I realized how strong Alchemist Curse is. So the second game onwards, I took Alchemist Curse instead. For my opponents, so it's basically Obsidian and Magic and Mortar Fire. Three sets of Obsidian Golems, one Inferno and Dravak. His Iron Caster has the level 2 Alchemist Curse, which is hot stuff, which is very powerful in this game. 
in in all games actually, Alchemist Curse is really really very strong in the material plane. And two Motas, one Basusu to cause some havoc. The next part, um, because this is a Helpies Rift campaign, I've included the campaign background story, which was uh, crafted by me. It's, it's quite a simple one, so don't expect some uh, award-winning novel material. So I'll be trying to do the the narrative segment in the narrative format. So it's impromptu, so it's not going to be the best, but here we go. Kerrigar, Queen of the Swarm. The periodic magical backlash pulsates through her engorged head again, throwing Kerrigar to her knees as she struggled to regain composure. She tries to remember her past so that she doesn't lose her soul. She was a dwarf with a strong aptitude for magic, and she became a flame priest for the three dwarf clans. Her gift of magic was not well received by her peers though, as dwarves in general despise magic and she was constantly looked down upon. Her commander treated her exceptionally badly, as a commander hates magic with a passion. He sent Kerrigar on a suicide mission to hold back a tide of abyssal dwarves and their red slaves. Kerrigar was almost instantly overwhelmed by the enemy and awaited her death. The abyssal dwarves, however, had other plans for her. Dwarves with a gift of magic are especially prized to be mutated into red kin brood mothers, as their magical powers allow them to mentally command a brood of rats. And so the transformation began to turn Kariga into a dwarf rat monstrosity. What the abyssal dwarves did not anticipate was that her magical potential far exceeds the servitude magic that binds the rat kin to the abyssal dwarfs' will. As soon as her transformation was complete, she slayed the Abyssal Dwarf surgeons that worked on her, and escaped the mutation chambers into the abandoned tunnels. Skittering noises filled her head like a buzzing that refuses to go away, and she screamed in pain. And through the agony, she realized she was able to hear the thoughts of other Redkin and communicate with them with her mind. Things happen very quickly when it comes to rats, and within a few weeks, she found herself commanding a brood of her own, all the rats serving her because of her role in the swarm as a brood mother. Her uncontrollable increase in magical power also meant that her mental capacity is higher than any normal brood mother, and she commanded a host much larger than she should. Her head began to swell to a monstrous size as well. But with all that also came a sensory overload and she wears a huge iron mask to cover her enlarged head and her eyes, to mask her sense of sight to help cope with her enormous power. Her most loyal of the brood are the shock troops that were with her since the first day, the Queen's Black Guard. Now she scours the tunnel ridding the world of her former Abyssal Dwarf's captors and their Abyssal allies. Her former Dwarf clans though, are they still her allies? For abandoning her to die, but now in fate's cruel irony, she turned into the enemy that she was supposed to fight. She will decide should she ever see them again. The magical backlash assaulted Kariga again, but this time there was something different. Something powerful was unleashed in the Helpy tunnels. She can sense it calling out to her. Among the thousands of Redkin thoughts filling her mind, that voice became clearer. Come seek me. The Abyssal Dwarfs has occupied the Helpy Mountains ever since driving the Free Dwarf clans back through the cataract to the Imperial lands of Abakar. The Iron Caster Dravik Dalkan has been leading a force to scour the remaining Free Dwarfs in the many mountain tunnels underground but he is also drawn by an ancient magic emanating from deep within the tunnels and has been searching it out. He finally uncovered it in Crack Hut. Deep within the underground caverns, an ancient power was discovered. Dravak unleashed the Nexus. A blast of light pierced the heaven and can be seen halfway around the world. All the magic users in Panatop also sense the magical shockwave. wave. 
factions are all mobilizing their forces to the Helpy Mountains to investigate, control, or destroy this nexus. Dravik wanted all the power to himself, but knowing that the entire world will be coming for this power as well, he has no choice but to form alliances to secure his position in Crackheart. Factions are all started to settle down on the fringes of the Helpy Mountains to form alliances as well. Alliances formed and dissolved just as fast as factions find allies which their goals aligned and they merge with or eliminate other alliances. Alliances are also changing constantly, filled with double-crossing and backstabbing. As the dust settled, two alliances remain standing. The Elios Alliance believe that the ancient power is meant to be harnessed and used, some for the good of the world, but mostly for their own agenda. Dravok Dalkan is the face of the Elios Alliance, and with him is the ambitious Magni Blackheart. The Gorath Alliance are factions who are wary of any ancient power beyond their knowledge. They would sooner isolate it and seal it away for centuries more. Kerrigar, of course, wants vengeance on the Abyssal Dwarfs. Record of the Doskaro Skirmish the Red Slaves have rebelled, taking the sides of the Gorat Alliance. Those traitors, led by Kerrigar, Queen of the Swamp, have laid claim to the village of Dotskaro, a vital position at the border between Lafenifag and the Rift. Magni Blackheart sets out with his army of golems, being tasked to quell the rebellion and take back the village of Dotskaro. As Magni arrives, he noticed the traitor Red Slaves have already formed up a battle line ready to invade the lands of the Abyssal Dwarves, pushing them further away from the rift. The two armies met at the border and prepared themselves for a blood fest. As Queen Kerrigar deployed her forces, she noticed that the army has split their Abyssal Golems into three sides, the set left, the center and the right. With the right having the support of Infernoch as well, it seems tough to break through. She laid out some forces to sacrifice themselves and focused more on the center and the left. With the left having the faster force of the Tunnel Runner Regiment and the Demon Spawn, Kariga hopes to break through the left quickly and swing towards the center. She has laid the shock troops in the center in anticipation of heavy mortar fire. With their higher nerf, she hopes that they would be able to weather all the shooting. Only one shock troop horde was in view of the mortars at the start of the combat and they were in cover. The rats won the initiatives and took the first turn, moving up quickly. With the magic of the nexus, channeling it confused Inferno as it punched the golems beside him. The Red Swarm has moved up. On the Abyssal Dwarf's turn, they laid magical fire and heavy mortar fire onto the Queen's Blackguard, dealing 9 damage. Next, Kariga commanded all the shock troops to charge, with the Blackguard attacking the Black Souls, while the Red Shock troops attacked at the Black Heart's elite the lower obsidian golems. They dealt heavy damage but did not take out these two units. There is a regiment of shock troops ready to assist the black guard in taking out the black souls next round. On the left, because of the forest, the rats have no choice but to push up into the forest to be able to see the lower obsidian golem, giving the lower obsidian golems the first charge. With their positioning, they are ready to flank charge the golems in return. Over on the right side, Kariga pulled back the forces to try to delay Inferno and the lower abyssal golems as long as they can. The demon spawn is ready to fly to the center if it is not stopped. The abyssal dwarf's response with counter charges in the middle and on the left, the lower obsidian golem goes into the demon spawn. Mortar fire and magical energies assault at the tangle. 
Basusu, who flew over the building in the first round, charged at Kariga, but Kariga's thick height held true. In response, the shock troops took out their adversaries. On the left, Demon Spawn, Tano Runner, and the Brute Enforcer went into the lower Obsidian Golems. But against all odds, the lower Obsidian Golems held, and their Iron Resolve meant that they are not devastated. In their response, the Nexus channeled an enraging energy and the low obsidian golems took out the demon spawn. As the battle continued, Drava commanded Infernoc to come towards the center to assist and not deal with the side anymore. With Basusu attacking the red shock troops along with Infernoc, the red shock troops fell. Mortar fire and magic took out the black guard. Over on the flank, Kariga tried to send the Brute Enforcer into the lower Obsidian Golems so that the Shock Troop Regiment could run across to invade into the opponent's side. But the Brute Enforcer died in one round of combat and the Shock Troops would not be able to make it. On the sixth hour of combat, Basusu dealt heavy damage to the Central Shock Troop Regiment. However, the Shock Troop Regiments held and the battle would have been won if not for the extension of another hour of combat. These shock troops would fall in the next round. Near the end of the battle is the battle of the mages. Magni Blackheart, on the sixth hour, channeled his strongest alchemist curse, tapping into the eye of the storm, wounding himself heavily in hopes of taking out Kariga. Kariga, however, survived the magical onslaught, and with the extension into the seventh hour of combat, she retaliated and drained the life force off of Magni, taking out Magni Blackheart. The battle, however, came to a stalemate. When the battle ended, Infernoc and the lower Obsidian Golems have invaded into the Redkin lands. While for the Redkin, they had the Tunnel Runners, the Brute Enforcer, and Kariga herself invading the opponent's grounds. Magni's body was taken back by his followers and his soul was imbued into an Infernox, and he is reborn for his next battle. So that was the battle report, and I'm sorry that there were quite a lot of pictures missing in between, but basically I took out the shock troops, uh, sorry, my shock troops took out the middle, right, but they both eventually fell to, uh, the, the black shock troops fell to magical magic and shooting, right, because they already took 9 damage at the start, although there's a bit of drain life and radiance going on, but with the heavy magical fire and uh, and the mortar, they eventually went out. Well, I popped the plague pots in somewhere in turn two when I charged in, so that the retaliation would the the counter charge would do minimal damage. So after that, they still died to shooting, of course. And yeah, the red shock troops also died to the infernoc and and what's it called, the pasusu. But early on. They also took some damage from the lower abyssal horde that countercharged. So learning points, let's talk about this. So when I deployed my forces, I was uh, ready to minimize damage from his war engines. The only targets for the war engines were the ones in cover. So at the start of the, as, as I deployed, I've already decided which side that I will want to push and which side I wanted to delay. I think that was still the correct choice and would have turned out better if not for the crucial snake eyes. So, um, invade, when the scenario is invade, you need to push the opponent's side, right? And the opponent has strong shooting, so I'll try to go first if I win the initiative, right? If not, I will have uh, taken some damage at the start, and then the, the red shock troops will have fallen even faster because it will take one free round of shooting. So, Basusu is quite difficult to deal with. He's one of the best flying individuals in the game. He flew over the building in the first round, landed somewhere that I can't see, and then second round charged in. Um, I don't know if I could have prevented it. Sometimes, if you try to, you know, position yourself so that you can charge him if he charge a unit of yours, then he because he's down in the middle of the board, he can he's got a lot of choices of who he wants to charge, and it's a little bit hard to guard against anyone that he wants to charge. So if you can, you know, set up for a counter charge if he charges my my brute mother maybe he charged the tango instead right then so it's a bit hard to deal with so sometimes i think 
just ignore and just push forward just take the losses so i took quite a lot of uh, war engine fire so maybe i should consider some war engine hunters in my list that's probably like you know individuals with flying and or on the mount because the red king mount i think speed nine and then maybe you can take the scout things like that and that's it i hope uh this impromptu narrative style battle report is something that you like and i'll continue covering this local campaign the next uh the next game will feature the progression into the abyssal plane with a lot of fluff as well i posted some of this in the fanatics and kow forum you can check it out over there and i'll try to link the campaign stuff in the description of this video so if you'd like to run the campaign maybe you can check it out so if you enjoyed this do like subscribe and hit the bell icon for notifications i'll see you in the next video